before Brandon puts the uh, start to slide you upstairs I want to say to you that um, past 36 hours I've had a I've had a real struggle I don't have a struggle because I doubt whether our Lord Jesus is on the throne I don't really have a struggle of worried about my life I have a struggle of about the message that we give and what we're ready for. And for that reason, the message that you find on your bulletin, if you got your bulletins turned over ready to start, it's not going to be the message for this morning. That, that message will be for tonight. I would ask you, if you will, to take your Bible and turn to the prophecy of Ezekiel, chapter 16. The prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 16. As I began to prepare this message, I couldn't figure out a title. Titles are important to people. And when I thought about what God was trying to get through to me and hopefully to us this morning only thing that could come to mind is warning and so i just simply titled this message today be forewarned you know each week when the preacher stands to preach the average church in america today the average church member believe that his one message should be jesus saves and it is true, Jesus saves. That's the message that we give the world. He saves us from sin. He saves us from the power of sin. He saves us from the penalty of sin. And one day, he will save us from the very presence of sin. He saves us from eternal punishment to eternal life. He saves us in this way that we do not have a relationship with God left to ourselves. And he saves us by restoring our relationship to our loving Father. He saves us from that eternal place called hell to give us a secure place in heaven. For the last 10 years, I have faithfully stood in this pulpit and tried to preach no other message than Jesus saves. And when he saves, he changes lives. I sure hope that today, and I pray that today you can pull this, that message from this particular sermon, but I'm going to say this to you. I've been in the pulpit right at 25 years, and I have never preached a message like this. David Burton, wall builders, reminds us that in the history of America, that many times what went on in the week, the preacher spoke to on the weekend to help people have some grasp on it. That's my heart today. Today's a sad day. I hope the sadness has covered your heart because it surely ripped at mine on Friday as I began to see the images. It brings with it, or it should bring with it, tears. A sense of devastation. A sense that the world has changed. A sense of pain. A sense of sorrow. And quite likely, a sense of fear. Chances are we have not felt this way as a nation for 14 years, 9-11-2001. Now, we should have felt this way three years ago in the aftermath of Benghazi, but because that didn't happen here on our land, and it seemed to be some faraway land, even though four Americans died that day, we as a nation, as a culture, have largely dismissed it, moved on. We wept with the families, and, and we just kind of moved on. But we really haven't had much response. On Friday, we were stunned, shocked at the horror. We were shot, stunned and shocked, if not frightened, at the horror, and of all places, Paris. I had taken a couple of days off 
couple of preacher friends had invited me to Tennessee on a getaway trip. And I was sitting in that room watching these events, and it occurred to me, deep in my spirit, that this could well be, now you're listening, a precursor to world events. Because if they can get into Paris, who has been on high alert, make no mistake that the group that attacked Paris is headed here. Every piece of intelligence, and when I use the word intelligence, Mike, I'm talking about every piece of information, not necessarily smarts. Every piece of intelligence tells us that this group will not rest until life in America as we know it has been turned upside down. I confess to you that I sat there in that room on the bed watching TV and I began to cry. But I didn't cry for me. At my age, I have almost reached that three score and ten which the Bible speaks of. I wept for my children. I wept for my grandchildren. And I wept for hundreds of thousands of other boys and girls, now listen, who have been educated and brought up in a system that I believe this book would now call perverse, immoral, and unethical. I, le- I wept because... When I compare our culture in America to Holy Scripture, it leads me to believe that the greatest help I can be today would be forewarn, to forewarn warn us about what's on the horizon. For years, we have quoted Billy Graham as saying, in America, 70 to 80 percent of church members are lost. Now, I want to just confess this to you. When I wrote my book, and they were called Christians. I went out looking for the source to tell what day, what time, what setting he said that. And honestly, I could not find it. I don't doubt that he said it, but I just couldn't find it. But I did find something else that fits right here to where we are in this nation that I want to convey to you today. I read a statement that Ruth Graham was supposed to have said, if God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. So I went looking for the source. And you know who the source of that statement is? It's none other than Dr. Billy Graham himself. Let me read this to you. In July 2012, Dr. Graham writes, Some years ago, my wife Ruth was reading the draft of a book that I was writing. When she finished a section describing the terrible downward spiral of our nation's moral standards and the idolatry of worshiping false gods, such as technology and sex, She startled me by exclaiming, if God doesn't punish America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. She was probably thinking of a passage in Ezekiel, the one we're about to read, where God tells why he brought those cities to ruin. Dr. Graham goes on. I wonder what Ruth would think of America if she were alive today. In the years... Since she made that remark, millions of babies have been aborted, and our nation seems largely unconcerned. Self-centered indulgence, pride, and a lack of shame over sin now are now emblems of the American lifestyle. With that background, if you found that scripture, Ezekiel 16, would you stand for just a moment as we read a few short verses from the prophet? Verse 48, as I live, declares the Lord God, your system Sodom, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty, and did an abomination before me. 
That's the same abomination that the federal court just told us that we had to uh, uh, do. Samaria, or Israel, has not committed half your sin. You have committed more abominations than they and have made your sisters appear righteous by all the abominations that you have committed. Father, for the next few minutes, would you hover in this place? Would you give us comfort where we need to be comforted, but would you convict where we need conviction? In Jesus' name, amen. Did you catch what was in this scripture? Did you catch what was written here? The description of a country that was about to be eliminated from existence. In context of this history, Israel, Samaria, had years earlier been eliminated, eradicated. And now Judah is about to receive the same judgment. I'm not a prophet, nor I'm a son of the prophet, but for the last 15 years, particularly since 9-11, I have tried to view America through the lens, through the vision, through the eyes of a prophet, and what I see really doesn't look good. The symptoms of Sodom were that they were rich, that they were overfed, and they had way too much money. They were haughty. When you have all those things, it leads to haughtiness. It leads to immorality and the poor didn't really register in that rich culture they were kind of left on their own and that country was destroyed eliminated by the way they think they finally found a a few remnants they can't confirm it of Sodom because nobody can tell you where Sodom really was because when God wipes out something it's gone for me this indictment is frightening when I think of Judah Because God chose to erase Israel. And he gave Judah a few more years to repent and return to him. And instead of returning to God, they continued running from God. Instead of receiving what God had for them, they chose to reject God. God sent prophets like Ezekiel to warn them. But the reason that they wouldn't listen, I believe, is bound up in the reason America and the American church doesn't listen today. It is because they didn't believe that God would ever judge them. They had had it so good for so long, money in the bank, that they didn't think God would judge them. And yet, just a few years after this was written, around 586 B.C. Now listen, don't miss this. God sent a powerful, heathenistic, barbaric enemy to eradicate them, killing many of them. If you read your history books, carried off others, hooking them together with hooks and chains. It was savage. Brothers and sisters, it, it irks us at our point of of comfort and convenience to see or to witness or even hear about Christians having their heads taken off by a knife. Surely, ISIS couldn't be someone God could use. Nebuchadnezzar was. And it's against that backdrop. Now, what I want to do this morning, I want to ask us four questions. And do my best to biblically answer those four questions in a spiritual way. I will pause a second to say, some of you have already said, Brother Jerry, is it your intent today to scare us? And I will tell you, I've never had a desire to scare people. You can't scare people into heaven. And all I would say to you, if what it takes to get our attention is to frighten us, so be it. Because I believe the days are short. They're changing rapidly. This Have you noticed in the last year how rapid this culture that was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. We may not have been a Christian nation, but we were founded on the principles of Scripture. Today things are changing. And although I understand Jesus 
is still on the throne. He's still in charge. And I understand that evil will ultimately not win out. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Evil is winning battles today. And when evil wins battles, we lose young lives. We lose old lives. We lose many things that we think we can keep. And we lose this while God's people in America, the most resourced church ever known to mankind, is asleep. I am going to give you this warning. If you're you're children, if you're grandchildren, if your family gets swallowed up in this growing evil, please do not point the finger at this pulpit and say that my preacher never warned us. In the face of such evil, coddling is not what we need, although it is what we want. In the face of such evil, what's really needed is a little reality. So let me ask four questions. Question number one. Why did this violence happen? Now, I could stand before you like so many and say, I don't know, and certainly I don't know all the reasons. At the same time, some people will say, Why? where was God when this happened? Why did God allow this to happen? And I want to just say this to you. The truth is, God is where he always is. He's ever present. He's ever available. He's always looking. He's always listening. But I want to remind you also that God was present when Satan killed Job's family. He was looking. He was listening. He was longing. The reason this happened, folks, have you missed this? Is that we live in a fallen world. And as a part of a fallen world, evil raises its ugly head. And God looking when evil raises its ugly head. But it's, we chose this evil back in the Garden of Eden. And And it's the evil of the world is the very reason Jesus had to leave heaven, had to come to earth, had to die a violent death on a cross. I was thinking about this and praying about this. Jesus died a violent death on the cross, and he was innocent. He was just as innocent on the cross as those soccer fans and those moviegoers in Paris, as those folks who inhabited the Twin Towers 15 years ago. He died an innocent death just like they did. But in his death, he provided a way to overcome evil. He provided a light. And the reason so many continue to be killed in this world It's because that so few allow Jesus to step into their life and change them and transform them from the inside out. Let me make this statement to you. Jesus did not come to make your life better. He came to make your life different. Jesus came to offer us help and hope. The reason this violence goes goes on in this world is because this world is walking in darkness. This world is lost. This world is stumbling alone. This world has never seen the light of Jesus. And this world depends on us to show the light of Jesus. Just a few weeks, we're going to start back Lottie Moon. Do you realize that our International Mission Board, in a time when the world is going dark, our International Mission Board is having to cut six to eight hundred missionary positions because God's people are not supporting the mission effort. And at a time when the gospel needs to go forward, the mission board is having to retreat. Why did this happen? Because we live in a fallen world. Question number two. Why am I preaching this message? This is as simplistic as we get. Because We are not ready. You know what I fear? I fear that when they come, not if they come, I fear that when they come, we will not be ready. Jesus said this. He said, if you confess me before men, 
I'll confess you before my father. And if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. My fear is that when they come, and they will, and when the knives are at our throats and the guns are at our heads, I fear what we might do. Why, Brother Jerry, you think we're that bad? No. I don't think it's about us being bad people. I think that we've lived so long in this prosperous ease, in this affluence, that we have little grasp on what it means to be persecuted for our faith. I mean, after all, we live in the United States of America. We have freedom of religion. It's written right into the Constitution. It is written into the Constitution. But I call you to pay attention if you've not been. And over the past 50 years, every pillar, foundation of this culture as being free to worship has been removed. Prayer out of schools. Ten Commandments kicked out of the public places. Although there's no law to say it's legal, the highest court in the land has rendered an opinion, and that's all it is, an opinion, that sodomy is normal and okay. In our school systems, we've intimidated administration and teachers into believing that it is illegal for them to either read the Bible or speak the name of Jesus. And most recently, this week, kind of blown away that now college students are telling us that college is supposed to be free. So basically, we're supposed, everything's supposed to be free. Kind of violates the biblical work ethic. Brothers and sisters, on our watch, here in these days, our culture has disintegrated while we sit back and are at ease in Zion. Paul wrote to the Romans and he said, it's high time. I remember when my grandmother used to say that, it's high time, Jerry, and I knew I was in trouble when she said high time. Paul said, it's high time that we'll wake out of our sleep. Because, are you listening? Because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And in that, he's not talking about being in heaven. He's talking about the end of time. You look around the world and you see what's going on. I can't figure out what's holding our Lord back. Time is almost over. But if he doesn't come, if he tarries, I'm afraid that these, this group is going to wind up here in Hueytown, Alabama. And the church of the living God is going to be caught sleeping. That's why. The third question is the one I'm just going to mention for the sake of time. Why am I so sure that America is a target? And I probably should have said, why am I so sure that America is the target? <laughs> Years ago, Dean Register, a friend of mine that preached here one of our Monday nights back in like 2007, he told me a long time ago, he said, Jerry, if you carry the football, somebody's going to try to tackle you. The reason America is the target is because we've been carrying the football. We've been the shining light in the world. We're the greatest country to ever, to ever uh, uh, call ourselves a country. But you want to know why I believe I believe if you go back to Ezekiel and you read what we just read, and every time you see the word Sodom, every time you read the, the name Samaria, you, inter you interject, you replace it with the name America. And you see whether it fits or not. You see, I, I've been reading a lot of prophecy lately, and, and I'm stunned, and I'm stunned. Stunned at the parallel between um, Israel and Judah and America. And I'm smiling because I kind of think, Brother Terry, that the Jewish people were, were a large Baptist church. Because they were together. God called them together, do a great work together, and they couldn't get along and they split and made two churches out of it. 
Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And God got so tired of it, he ultimately, he ultimately destroyed both. When I read the prophet Jeremiah, which I have been reading lately, I am stunned at the parallel between America, the church of America, God's chosen people, and Israel and Judah, God's chosen people. They were called to repent. I believe God's message in this room, in this town, in this state, in this country is repent or else. Isaiah and Judah chose not to repent. They chose to continue to rebel. Oh, they were doing too good. God couldn't judge them. And yet God did just that. He annihilated them, and they could not even be found. And at that point, I'm, I return to the words of Ruth Graham. Last question. What can we do? What can you do about it? If you will, take your Bible and turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. Now don't panic. We're not going to be here another 30 minutes. Those who have been here for any time know that I believe God's word is important enough to finish but I just don't want to make us just have a marathon. But I want, to, I want us to read these four verses, first four verses. And I'm going to tell you five things we can do very quickly. The prophet writes in verse 1, he says, If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord to me, you should return. If you remove your detestable things from my presence and do not waver, do not second guess yourself, get rid of them. And if you swear, as the Lord lives in truth and justice and in righteousness, then nations shall bless themselves in him and in him shall they glory. For thus the Lord, for thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord. And remove the foreskin of your hearts. O men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, let my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of your evil deeds. So what are we going to do? Let me suggest you five things very quickly. Number one, we need to return. We need to return to him. The, Bible's told, the Bible records that God told his people, if you will return, I will relent. If you return, you will be able to skip this judgment. But they didn't. And somebody goes, well, I don't see where he's re relenting here. Well, let me just give you another story. Most of us know 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. Do you all know what that says? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will hear their land. And every revival, we, re we repeat that formula that God has given to us, and you would be correct but that's not all the story. Most of us don't know the story. In the chapter 6, Solomon had finished his construction. That great temple. And when he got the temple uh, constructed, he put about a, a four by four by four uh, platform up. And he raised his hands in front of the multitude. And he prayed a prayer for his people. And it wasn't a now I lay me down to sleep prayer. It wasn't a God is great, God is good prayer. It was this type of prayer. God if we follow you, bless us. But when we sin, and we will, when we sin and walk away from you, and you shut up the doors of heaven and no rain falls, and, and God, when, when you command the locusts to destroy everything that we have in those days, when we come back to you, please, God, hear us. Please relent. Please don't send judgment. So now you get to chapter 7. Oh, and in chapter 7... God says this, well, I've heard your prayer, and I've chosen this place for myself as a place of sacrifice. When I, God says, when I shut up the heavens, and when I command the locusts, or when I send pestilence to judge you, if my people, at that point in time, 
the ones called by my name, if they, will, if they will humble themselves and pray and they will seek my face and they turn from the wicked ways, in other words, if my people will repent, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their land, then I will respond. And we all stand up and we wave our hands and go, thank you, Jesus. But that's not the end of the story. Down in verse 19 might be good for us to know. But God goes on. If you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land. By the way, I'll pause there to say this. If you don't think this is his land, go read an honest reading. Not our modern day revisionist version of history. You go do an honest reading of how this nation was formed. And without the mighty hand of God protecting the, our forces... We would not be the United States of America today. There is no human reason why we should be in existence today except for the almighty hand of God. Many preachers in those days would preach a message like this on Sunday morning. And their their benediction, he would say, okay, men, grab your guns. We got some fighting to do. Then I will pluck you up from my land I have given you in this house I have consecrated. I will cast you out of my sight. I will make it a proverb and a byword, just something people speak of in passing. You see, folks, our call today, our call today is to return to Jesus, return to God, because if we don't, we're doomed. We're doomed as a people. We're doomed as a culture. We're doomed as a country. You know what we must do? We must become good repenters we've become horrible repenters because we're too proud to say we made a mistake we must become good repenters and realize that we're at ease in Zion and life could be changing we have to return the second thing is we have to remove he goes on and he says you must remove those detestable things We must remove some things from our lives. For too long in this nation, we have been taught that we could just come to Jesus and keep on just like we're going. But there are some things we've got to get rid of. What are the things in your life that displease God? Not according to you, according to him. If he was here, standing right here, and he, he is here in spirit, what would he say about your, or your, I'll tell you what he will say. Anything that's taken his place, it would be detestable to him. The number one broken commandment in this country today is the first commandment. Have no other gods before me. Remove it. And by the way, don't waver. Don't hesitate. Don't think about it. Get rid of it. Return and remove. Number three, restart. Verse two, if you swear as the Lord lives. Now, (laughs) let me just date us a little bit. How many of us remember hearing people say, God willing, Or if the Lord allows. And you know what? It wasn't just a statement. It wasn't just a byword. It was a feeling of the heart. That we we restore the sense that our life is a gift from God. He gave me my life, so my gift to him is I give it back to him and then live like it. Number four, restart. This may hit more of us in here than we know. Verse 3 says, break up your fallow ground and sow not among the thorns. Here's the question you have to come to grips with today. What part of your life has God put his hand on at some time in the past and told you to do and you've allowed to go dormant? You've allowed the the soil to kind of get hard. You know, when you're a farmer, you leave that that ground and it get hard. You break it up. You plant something. I dare say that most of us in this room could find a part of our life that needs to be broken up. For some of you, this part right here speaks to this. You have never let him break up the ground of your heart and save you and change you because you didn't want to be changed. You liked yourself just like you were. And yet Jesus died to transform your life into something better than you can even imagine. Break up the foul ground. Let the Spirit of God come in with that holy plow and break up your life and transform your life. Might be somebody here at the 
part of your life that's foul ground as God has told you to speak to somebody about their eternal destination, their eternal salvation, their eternal soul. And you've chosen not to. Do you realize that's the way you snuff out the light when God calls you to do something like that? The last thing I see here, in just the first two statements, it deals with circumcision. It says, circumcise your heart. Remove the foreskin. Circumcise yourself to the Lord and remove the foreskin of your heart. People can make fun that this is kind of a sexual thing, but here's what I will tell you. It was, it was a spiritual thing in the Old Testament. How it relates to us today, that we recover. You know what we recover? Sensitivity to the Lord. We remove the hardness around our heart. America, in large measure, has become hard-hearted, arrogant, haughty. And the call is to remove that callous from around your heart. America has that callousness, and I'm afraid it's crept, kept, crept into the church. How long has it been since we wept over someone who's lost their way? How long has it been since we wept over someone whom we know? If God is God and true to his word, they're not going to see heaven. How long has it been since we wept over the sin of our lives? How long has it been since we wept over our children? I know you're kind of ready for this to end. But I think that's always the case when a preacher chooses to preach prophetically from his word. This is not a message that I wanted to deliver today. For all kinds of reasons, some will become apparent in a little bit. But the truth is, you and I don't get to decide the timing of much in our lives or this world. I'm recalling on the good side Jonathan and Charlotte had gotten married, and they are kind of putting their lives together. And um, they weren't really expecting a child quickly. And all of a sudden, they were with child. Something greater, someone greater than them. Put that child, put Dallas in their lives. And I'm going to just tell you this. We look back now with the death of Charlotte's mom so untimely. Dallas was God's gift that couple at a time when they needed it. We don't get to decide timing. We found that out the 1990s attack on the Twin Towers, certainly with the 2001 attack on the Twin Towers, with Benghazi, with Paris. We don't get to decide the timing. That brings me to the last just thought. Just a little story. It's told of a man who entered, uh, who ran in almost out of breath to a train station. And he ran up to the clerk and he said, um, what time does the 801 train leave? And the clerk said, 801. And he says, okay, well, that's good. He said, but, you know, I noticed coming in, the, the town clock had, had 7.57 my watch has 859 and the clock in here has 804. Which clock should I go by? And the clerk said, you can go by whatever clock you want to. But you can't get on the 801 train because it left when that clock said 801. God's clock moves on and on. Hour by hour. Minute by minute. We can act like we're in control. We can act like we can go by our own clock. There are those of us who, think, who seem to think that we can live by any schedule that we want. But Benghazi and 9-11 and Paris and other places prove that we can't. What those things prove also is that it may be later than you think it is. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. At the risk of being misquoted and misunderstood, 
you've now been forewarned about the prophecies that apply to us. The question is, what will you do with what you now know? Will you return? Will you repent? Will you respond? Or will you reject and run and just take life as usual until judgment comes? Let's pray together.